a community were acting it out together. It has been one of the most moving experiences of my life, what happened on Friday in the church. And I would like to invite all the people who are involved in it, in any way at all, just to stand. Would you stand, those of you who are involved on Friday, whether you were the choir or an actor, don't be shy. Here we had Pilate. Here we had Jesus. Here we had uh, one of the Roman soldiers, various members of choir. Back over there, we had Joseph of Arimathea, who went and got Jesus down from the cross. Here we had one of the wailing women. Here we had one of the Pharisees. Here we had, uh, I've forgotten what you were, Ted, remind me. Parable reader, yes. Here we had Tom reading the Old Testament scriptures, a wailing woman, another wailing woman in the choir, in the choir. Here we had a Pharisee. Here we had Herod. You, this was Herod here. Here was Margareta leading the choir. And over here was one of the, one of the, um, the, the, uh, the robbers, you know, the insurrectionists crucified either side of Jesus. This is the one that wasn't very nice and didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And there was Iffy over there, who was Mary, the mother of Jesus, actually, and one of the wailing women. And here we had Judas. Just sit, <clears throat> sit down. And the reason I think I found this just so moving was, was that you guys, who I all know quite well, I've been here five years, haven't I now? Um, I, it was as though all our stories were being put together as we relived this terrible, terrible event of the crucifixion of Jesus our Lord. Um, lots of poignant moments in it. And we come here today just as we are, don't we? And it's not as though we suddenly, you know, kind of wipe the slate clean. Jesus is risen from the dead, hallelujah, he's risen indeed. Yeah? And all our problems are suddenly solved. Because it's not like that, is it, really? I'm going to show you five faces now. Five faces which may... Um, may strike a chord with some of you. Some of you might think, yeah, yeah, that's where I am today. Jesus is risen, I, I believe it, or I'm trying to believe it. Um, but this is how I'm actually feeling. Can we have the first face? A woman weeping. That's sure to be some of you here this morning. There may be men weeping here this morning. Maybe there's not open tears on your cheeks, as we see here, but maybe inside you're weeping. Next one. Here is somebody who's afraid. Are you afraid? What are you afraid of? Come to worship just as you are. Bring your fear into this service. What have we got next? Here's a man who's doubting. I wonder who's doubting here this morning. You know, you can be a person of faith and have doubts. That's a very real place to be. opposite of, uh, here comes the next one, here is despair, somebody who's been working really, really hard and has seen no fruit of their labors. Here is somebody who's broken, who's ashamed, who's just living with their brokenness and their shame. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, entered into the lives of the people on the ground as they really were. He pitched up in the middle of their lives and met them in their need, whatever kind of need it was. This is the remarkable thing about the resurrection accounts of Jesus' resurrection. We have them in all the four Gospels. Every one is different. Every encounter is unique because Jesus, who knows all the secrets of our hearts and whatever place I'm in or you're in, is ready, poised to meet me and to meet you just where you are. Not where you think the vicar thinks you ought to be, but where you actually are in your life right now. So would you like to turn to the Gospel of John? And um, let's have a look at chapter 20.
have a look at chapter 20. Jimmy's going to tell us what page that's on. Anybody got the page number? John chapter 20. 1089. Thank you, Trevor. 1089. Just give you a moment to find it in your Bibles. John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started, from the, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had, had, had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and she wept. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw the two angels in white seated at where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot, they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Who's weeping inside this morning? Who's lost something? To lose something precious to you is deeply distressing. Think of those people who lost their loved ones on that flight that crashed into the Indian Ocean and they couldn't find those bodies. Where are the bodies of our loved ones? Have they died? Where are they? Your distress may not be as great as that, but your sense of having lost something, maybe it is a loved one, but your distress of having lost your livelihood, your health, your partner. Are you weeping inside? If so, Jesus is ready to slip into your heart and meet you exactly where you are at. Come, now is the time to worship. Come just as you are. As as you are. Bring those inner tears to God. And in his perfect way, in his perfect time, Jesus will appear... You may not see him bodily. You probably won't. But somewhere in the depths of your spirit, you will recognize there is somebody near me who's come to meet me in my need as I have it right now. Roll on. Verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, 
when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear, for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Here we have the disciples. They've spent three years with their Lord, traveling around Judea. And they've seen Jesus die on the cross. They abandoned him at his arrest. They are full of fear now that the Jewish authorities and the Romans may come and round them up and put them on crosses too. A natural human fear. So they've gone back to their homes, bolted the doors for fear. Jesus, the Lord of all creation, now risen from the dead and alive, though unseen, appears in that room. Exactly at that moment, meeting them in their fear. What is your fear this morning? What are you afraid of? Part of the human condition to be fearful and afraid. So don't feel bad about being afraid. Don't feel bad about being frightened. Express it. Yesterday morning, early in the morning, I was in the hospital L&D with our dear brother, Philip, who was about to have a major operation. He's now had it. He was weeping for fear. What are they going to do to him now? And he let the tears out. Came out like that. Very healthy to weep for fear. What's your fear this morning? Now is the time to worship. Come just as you are. Let's roll on. Verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the other disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nail, the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put, my, put it into my side. Stop doubting and, and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen <clears throat> and yet have believed. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Doubt is part, a component within faith that I suggest all of us experience from time to time. Is this actually real, this story? Does it add up? Do I really believe it? Or do I just go to the church and hear the vicar talk about it? Do I? Really, Billy? That's a natural human feeling. That's normal. Come, now is the time to worship. Come just as you are. Come with your doubts. 
What's your doubt this morning? What are you doubting? You've heard all the church dogma, you've heard it all before, but what are you really doubting? Don't feel ashamed of your doubts. Own them. Lift them up and say, Jesus, if you really are alive, make yourself known to me. Please. Philip, who I visited in hospital yesterday morning, as he was crying and we were waiting for them to come and get him and take him to his surgery, he told me what happened to him in 1978, I think it was, when he was the verger in a church called Thomas the Apostle. This is Thomas here we're hearing about, Thomas the Apostle. As well as being the verger in the church, he was also the warden at the, camp, uh, the, the caravan site on Canvas Sands on the south side. So, sorry, on the south coast. And Philip said to me, <clears throat> Martin, one year when we had this big service and all the churches came along to our church, I was the verger and the vicar got everything ready and I helped him. And uh, then at the end of the service, this man came up who had a turban on his head. And he said, the man with the turban on the head said to me and the vicar, he said, um, in your service... I saw Jesus. Oh, thank you. It's lovely to have you with us here this morning. Where are you staying? Oh, I'm only here on holiday. I've come all the way down on holiday, and I, it was raining outside this morning, and so I had nothing else to do but to come to your church. So I came, and I saw Jesus behind the rear of us. So they thought, thank you, Jesus, for pitching up this morning, and uh, this man went back, and then the next year, they had another one of these services in August, and, and the same man came along, and he, he didn't have his turban on. So they said to him, it's lovely to see you again, you haven't got your turban on this year. He said, no, why not? What has happened to your turban? Well, do you not remember? Last year, I saw Jesus in your church, and I've become one of his followers now. I've been baptized and I've become a Christian because, because I saw Jesus in your church. Following year, when his holiday came, back he came. Jesus is poised beyond time and space, if you can get your head around that. Poised alive in the spirit, waiting to pitch up and meet me in my doubt and you in your doubt right now just like that you may be one of the fortunate ones like Thomas and this man this Sikh to see Jesus but Jesus teaches us here he says blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed let's roll on to chapter 21. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Gal Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did this, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred meters. 
When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Now, this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Who has known futile labor in their life? Who has been, as it were, pulling out the nets, laboring, 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 and seeing Nothing for, the, for all the, your labors. Just wave a hand. Who's ever been in that place? Futile work. Why am I teaching these children? They don't want to learn about French grammar. Why am I bothering? Why am I putting out all the chairs for the people to come to church? They don't really want to come. They're just coming out of a sense of duty or just to see their friends. I know, Heidi, you come for other reasons. I know you do. I know you do. Why am I doing all the accounts for these firms? It's so boring. It's so futile. Is there no more to life than adding up sums on spreadsheets? Why do I lose my first joy? And why am I no longer like this little girl running around? Why has my labor become so futile? I practice my scales and arpeggios day after day after day. Do I get any better on my violin? Who's been in that place? Futile labor. She's brightening up my day for me. (laughs) Heidi, God bless you. Maybe Jesus is coming with a message to me. Martin, cheer up, you miserable old man. (laughs) Why are you so miserable? Jesus is risen from the dead. Get a life vicar. You see, I just love the fact that Jesus allows them to fish all night long and catch absolutely nothing. Why do I love this? Because he wants them to get to the point of almost despair. Just think how much had gone wrong for them by this time. Jesus had died on the cross. They'd lost their hopes. They'd lost their hope they'd ever be delivered from the Romans. Everything had gone to pot. The only thing left to do was to go back to the spreadsheet Go back to the scales and arpeggios. Just pick up the the plot where they've left off and they've fished all night long, professional fishermen, and caught nothing. Jesus waits to the moment has come when they are on the brink of despair before he with uttermost gentleness and sensitivity to their condition doesn't go boo, but says, hey, try another one, try another approach. Put the nets on the other side. And they go, oh, who's that funny man on the shore telling us how to do our job? We're professionals. Well, we'll just do what he says. They put the nets down the other side, 153 big fish come out into the net, and the net isn't torn. Isn't that good? (laughs) Isn't that good, Heidi? Yeah. But but Jesus waits for this moment to come before he does this. Yeah. I said to my wife last night, I don't know how to do services for little children anymore. I haven't got any in the house. I've got no grandchildren. How do I appeal to little children? Thank you for hiding, for helping me, Heidi, in my in my need. Do you see? Come now is the time to worship. Come just as you are. 
come with your sense of your life being futile and running into the sand and getting nowhere. Because, you see, this is the point, the very moment when he is most likely to manifest himself. You may not recognize the moment when it's come, as they didn't. And they'd lived three years with him. They ought to have recognized him, but they, they didn't. Wait. Keep on fishing. Try putting the nets down the other side if it helps, but just keep going. Don't give up. And now, finally, our last passage, our last section. Verse 15, chapter 21 of John's Gospel. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Peter, with the others, has caught the 153 fish. He's had a breakfast with his Jesus. Jesus is alive. He's continuing to work his miracles. But Peter is broken inside. He's come to the breakfast, but inwardly he's broken. We know why. We saw it on Friday. At the point of Jesus' arrest, when the women had come and said, you're one of his, you're one of his followers, we recognize it from your accent, you're a Galilean, you speak with a Galilean accent, you must be one of Jesus. And Peter three times said, leave me out of this, know nothing about this. And the third time, cock crows, Peter remembers he told me I was going to do this, deny him three times, and the cock was going to crow. I did, and my, I let him down in his hour of greatest need. I cannot get over the sense of shame. I'm so full of shame that I let him down. If you this morning have a sense of shame, if you have a sense of brokenness that you did not live up to what you promised to live up to, Jesus is there to meet you. However many times you let him down, he will meet you the same number. Peter let him down three times. He met him three times. And reinstated him to the place he had originally given him. You are Cephas. You are the rock on whom I will build my church because you, Peter, recognized that I am the Messiah, the anointed one, the one to come. And it's on you, Peter, that I will build my church. So Peter runs with that, follows Jesus, has his hour when he denies all knowledge of him. But Jesus who has the whole picture of Peter's life, reinstates him to the place he had originally given him, puts him back together so gently. He doesn't say, G Peter, you let me down just when I needed you most. He doesn't even say that. He just says, 
Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Do you love me? And then so beautifully, I think, he just gives him a little job to do. Actually, quite a big job. He says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He didn't realize yet that that would be all the people in Judea, Jerusalem, Israel. Right round to all those funny, smelly, burping Gentile people as well. Oh, what a lot of lambs to feed. What a lot of people to do feed. And Peter did it. And this gospel ends, read it when you get home, with Jesus telling him, by the way, Peter, um, you are going to get old and people are going to come and uh, take, you, you know, you're, they're going to put, hang you up and you're going to go the same way that I went. Peter died for his faith. Feeding the lambs, doing the stuff. So, come now now is the time to worship come just as you are our story our story the one we acted out on friday two days ago our story is his story his story is our story Jesus' story, ongoing because he's risen from the dead, is to enter the slipstream of my life, your life, to meet us in our doubt, in our despair, in our sense of futility, in our fear, in our brokenness, and frankly, in whatever state we might find ourselves. Jesus, you are risen from the dead. Hallelujah. We pray, meet us in our need. We offer you our need right now, whatever it may be. And we say, Lord Jesus, please come and meet us in that need, in your own perfect way, in your own perfect timing.